All right, I think we can get started. It's already 11. Hello and good morning, everybody. It's a lovely, lovely Saturday morning out here in Bengaluru. And I'm sure all of you will have a great time today. So I'm Abhijit Roy, co-founder and CEO of Golden Pie, online platform of choice of lakhs of users for their fixed income needs. So let's get started today. This, you know, an acute dearth of information and knowledge amongst our investors in this community on fixed income investments, especially outside bank FDs. Now at Golden Pie, we have been on a mission to bridge this gap. I'm happy to share with you that starting today, we are initiating this webinar series. Here, we will be inviting the market makers, the behemoths and the rising stars from the industry who will join us and will be sharing information about how their companies are shaping up this field or contributing to this field of fixed income. With that, you know, we will be having a very open discussion with their management and we'll be hearing directly from them about how the company is shaping up, what are the financials, what are the future outlook, and I hope with that information, you will be well informed about this company. And if there are investment decisions to be made, you can make an informed decision then. So for today, I'm truly delighted to invite our first company, that's Earthmate, a rising credit exchange and NBFC company. And we have the management with us over here. Let me take the pleasure of introducing them. So we have with us Mr. Madhusudan, who is the CEO of Earthmate. Madhusudan has done his MBA from ICFAI and has got 20 years of deep FinTech experience. Then we have Mr. Mohit, who is the head of customer success at Earthmate. He has done a CA and then MBA from IIM Lucknow. Mohit brings to the table 25 years of experience in the banking and NBFC space. And last but not the least, Mr. Somit, who's the head of strategy at Earthmate. Somit did his engineering from IIT Chennai and then his MBA from IIM Ahmedabad. And he brings to the table a deep consulting and technology experience from the FinTech space. So gentlemen, welcome to the show. So let's get started. First question to you, Somit. So what's the meaning of Earthmate? And you know, what is the problem statement that you guys are trying to solve? Yeah, just to give a quick introduction, Earthmate is a B2B fintech platform, right? Which has its own NBFC as well, right? And when we started Earthmate, our first problem statement or the end consumer that we were targeting and that we were trying to help out there are actually a lot of micro businesses which are there in India, right? And we are not focused only on large cities, right? Uh, even though we have started only two years ago, we have presence and we have lent money across all states in India. So we were looking at the businesses in Bharat, right? And that is what we were looking to target and help out. So the word earth, which is the first part of the name actually comes from the Hindi word artha because money is the area where we help out in and mate stands for friend, right? So that's where the name came out. And so what is the problem that you are trying to solve in the economy? Right. So if you look at, yeah, if you look at the Indian economy, right? So uh, once you go out of, you know, say large companies, medium-sized businesses, salaried individuals, what you would find that credit to the other people, the 80%, 90% of India is not easily available from, uh, you know, traditional sources, which is, you know, banks, traditional NBFC, so on and so forth, right? So, but we are not the only ones who are working to solve this issue. There are a lot of other players, right? So over 1000 plus lending fintechs have received VC funding over the last one year. And they are trying to solve, you know, this issue of reach, right? At some level or the other, right? They are targeting, you know, specific niches, specific kind of products, specific kind of customer segments, right? And all of these lending fintechs, one common problem that they have is the problem of raising funds 
through which you know they can uh, you know lend money to these customers right mm -hmm. so either these fintechs don't have uh, uh, an nbfc license in which case you know they need to tie up with a bank or an nbfc in order to lend and even in some cases when they do have an nbfc raising capital is always a constraint for them right so we come in there and we try to solve this problem for them through our tech enabled platform understood understood my next question would be to mr madhusudan so for our viewers today can you explain what is the business model that you have at earthmate and what is the way in which you are making money out of it yeah thank you so much first of all abhijit for this uh, uh, session that you are hosting for us so uh, my pleasure at at earthmate what we are doing uh, we are uh, our stripes are tech company first right we are tech first with an in house lending business and we are not a stand alone digital lender like many other platforms are so we have understood that to be able to efficiently lend money to uh, customers across the country there are two brilliant solutions that are tech enabled that needs to be first developed right so what we did uh, abhijit is we actually developed uh, propositions around uh, what we call as credit cloud right which means any customer can onboard completely digitally the entire loan management system loan origination system end to end repayments everything is managed digitally right so this this tech stack of my credit cloud is built in such a way that it can be used by any any nbfc or any lender who wants to directly plug in and start business say in a weeks time so that's the first proposition that we have developed second which is the heart of the lending business right and if you don't understand this uh, the business should not be in lending is the risk management right so that is the second proposition that we develop around our risk engine which means either uh, how do you uh, evaluate a customer based on surrogate data how do you uh, monitor the risk how do you get early warning signals out of the customer's behavior in terms of the repayment patterns and all of this we have combined into a solution our own proprietary solution called risk engine this is our second pillar once we have mastered these two is when actually we started lending to the customers so we have three propositions which is credit cloud risk engine and credit exchange which is our proprietary tool uh, or uh, the mechanism through which we actually lend to our borrowers and these three are individually monetizable for us and also they work perfectly in sync uh, uh, for ultimate plus mamta projects which is our in house nbfc through whom we lend, do our lending business uh, and this these three solutions combined to make uh, revenue for us uh, just to uh, give an example uh, on uh, how the actually implementation happens in the real world so the the risk engine that we have right is something like i uh, uh, brief earlier we while we anyway use it some of the big names in the industry who are a standalone in bfcs also use this solution and pay as a certain fee to actually use the solution right which means i make money out of credit cloud i make revenue out of the risk engine and also the net interest margin that i make out of my core lending business so i hence we are tech first with in house lending business as a core proposition well said so for our viewers if i you know have to summarize what 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 uh, madhusudan has just you know laid out the uh, business model it's a very interesting one uh, extremely technology focused as i understand which has got three main components one is a credit cloud which is a sort of you know an engine where in uh, there's the borrowers on one side and then there's the suppliers on another side right there's a risk engine which they also outsource or rather give as a service to other nbfcs and banks for their lending and then they have got their own nbfc arm as well right which is like which is good sign because that means they have got their skin in the game right they are not just enabling the flow of funds from the suppliers to the borrowers they are also infusing their own capital into the supply stream right so they have a skin in the game all right so you mentioned about mamta projects right uh, can you shed some more light on how mamta projects uh, uh, is associated with earthmate right yeah yeah, yeah. the structure sure. over there right see so as as uh, most of the viewers would be aware uh, right to be able to lend you you need to be a regulated entity which means you need to have an nbfc license right 
like I briefed earlier, we are a tech first with a lending capability. The entire tech capabilities on the credit cloud and risk engine, we have developed at our parent company, which is Arthmate Tech. So all the solutions are housed there. Whereas the NBFC license is with Mamta Projects, which is a 100% subsidiary of Arthmate Tech. So the way it helps us, Abhijit, is that because the tech solutions are housed independently, anybody can avail those solutions. And uh, NBFC, like I told you, is a regulated business. And so Mamta Projects is the regulated entity, which is 100% owned by Arthmate Tech. So Arthmate Tech is the parent. Mamta Projects is the subsidiary with the NBFC license. Got it. Got it. Um, you know, um, I would want to ask a question to Mohit, right? So uh, Mohit, uh, so the question to you is, how are you sourcing your borrowers, right? How do you get hold of your borrowers? Yeah, so uh, uh, we have a three-pronged approach, uh, uh, Abhijit. So when we started this business, right, and as uh, Madhusudan and Somit were mentioning, right, our thesis was partnership-driven, right? And we one thing which we, we never wanted to do was uh, burn money in terms of acquiring the customers, right? Yeah. So we uh, partner with three specific categories of uh, companies, right, which are, which are like a... Uh, you can say aggregator of customers for us, right? So the first line of business, what we have is fintechs, right? So we, there are multiple fintechs, as you might know, right, in the country. Uh, the biggest problem they face is that they are innovating in terms of how the lending can be done, but they don't have access to the debt lines, right? Because uh, the larger banks uh, or the uh, balance sheet providers, they don't understand, right, how to underwrite the digital risk. So we go and partner with these fintechs. We evaluate their customers and then lend to their customers, right? And in turn, we give them a, a sourcing fees, right? But, uh, uh, depending on uh, what services they are providing to us, right? The second category of companies are uh, the online platforms, right? So you'll see, uh, you see uh, Amazon, Flipkart, like, like that. We have now hundreds of platforms, right? Which are again an aggregator of merchants as well as the customers, right? So both on the consumer lending side and also on the merchant lending side, right? So we partner with them to uh, lend to the either their customers or merchants, right? For the business they are doing with, with the platform, right? Again, the entire credit underwriting, the risk underwriting uh, lies with us. They just act as a uh, lead source for us, right? And the third line of business which we have is the uh, supply chain, uh, anchor-based supply chain, right? So we will go to the larger companies like HUL, PNG, uh, so on and so forth, right? And we partner with them to uh, finance uh, their supply chain transactions, either on the vendor side or on the channel side. So when I say vendor side, it basically, uh, let's take an example of what, whatever HUL buys from their vendor, right? Mm -hmm. So can we uh, fund that transaction? And on the channel side, when HUL supplies to their distributor retailer, right? Can we fund that transaction? Right? So we partner with the anchor and then we fund their channel side. This also ensures us that one, the funds are being used for the legitimate business purposes, right? For income generating purposes, which reduces our risk in terms of getting the payment back. Secondly, because uh, these borrowers are in well integrated and dependent on these large organizations, right? So there's a less likelihood of default in this business. Understood. So um, if I have to, uh, you know, uh, put up the two kind or the two category or two cohort of, you know, borrowers that you are catering to, one are the individual, <laughs> the other, another one are the merchants or the MSMEs. In yeah. which two categories, one one would be the merchants directly, and the other one would be probably like you know the vendors of HUL for their delivery, last mile delivery, and all that. You're financing that, right? Exactly. So, yeah. So on the consumer side, I had that question. Uh, what kind of loans would you give to individuals? Is it for their personal usage? Like somebody wants to take a marriage loan or something, you know, wants to go for a vacation. Would you fund that or would it be for specific usage purposes only? Like how do you do that over there or what do you yeah. do over there? So our thesis uh, in terms of consumer loans, right? Uh, so one, we are product agnostic, right? So today uh, on the consumer loan side, we are doing uh, approximately 13, 14 products, uh, right? Uh, that starts from, uh, uh, let's say, a, a one week 
early wages or early salary product to a uh, 24 months personal loan product, right? But the primary thesis, uh, what we follow is that, uh, can we uh, define the use case or can we restrict the use case so that it is not, let's say the loan is not taken and used for gambling, right? right. Because then there's a less chances of that being paid. Right. So having said that in terms of product, what we do, so in terms of the short term product, uh, we do early wages basically uh, uh, underwriting the customer and giving them salary uh, adv in advance before the salary day we do earned wages this is uh, this product is specifically for the blue collared workers where let's say they have worked for two weeks we can uh, we have a tie up with their organization through the fintech partner and we can for those two weeks we can give them like whatever they have earned 70 percent of that amount so that their regular uh, expenses can be taken care of uh, then we do uh, uh, personal loan for education purposes, personal loan for healthcare purposes, uh, and so on and so forth, right? So like this, we have around 13, 14 products. Right. But in right. each of these cases, we try to uh, restrict the use cases. So clearly, you know, uh, what I understand is um, your technology pay plays a very vital role over here at the end of the day to find out the credit worthiness of any borrower. Yeah. Both, I think, with the intent as well as the capability, right? And and that's yeah. that's that's a key technology piece, uh, which uh, I think uh, you have you guys have solved. And then you know my next question would be on this. I would want to know from Somit, like, so what is this technology mode or this you know this uh, tremendous technology infrastructure for risk profiling? For you know customization of loan products that you have built, right? Uh, what is it that you have, you know you know what's the USP over here? If you can share with 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 uh, you know our audience today. Yeah. So if I have to break down the technology element, right, and the USP, right, the things which we do differently, right, from others, yeah. then I would break it down into two parts, right. One would be on the lending tech side, right, which is core to lending, right. How do you even lend, right? You need a loan origination system. You need a loan management system. You need to have links with, you know, uh, for instance, UAD, UAIDI, right, for Aadhaar verification with credit bureaus, etc. So that is one aspect and risk is a completely different aspect, which is more around, you know, risk evaluation, usage of alternate sources of data, so on and so forth, right? So on the first side, right, one of our major USPs is that the loan management system, right, which is the core software, you know, where a loan gets created, loan gets stored, where calculations are done is something that we have created completely in-house, right? When you go to any major bank or NBFC, this would typically be a software that they have licensed from some technology service provider, right? What is the difference with that, right? From the For the purpose of a bank or an NBFC, that is okay because they have standard products that they lend out to, right? In Through their own branch networks, right? So on and so forth. But when we integrate with fintechs, right? A lot of new age fintechs come up with very new kind of products, very different products, right? Where they're targeting a very particular group. For instance, if you have a microfinance sort of a loan, you could have very, very special repayment terms, right? Or if you're lending in a particular industry, right, where there is a cyclical revenue, then you can also have the interest payments designed in a cyclical way, right? Now, if these partners have to collaborate with or go to any bank or NBFC, typically, you know, in just in order to ensure that these types of loans can be managed, you know, these banks have to go back to their technology service provider. And, you know, they allocate resources, uh, you know, they understand what the usage is. It's easily a two to three month problem only from a tech side, not, not even from a credit evaluation perspective, right? Whereas with us, given that we are built for partnering with many people, right? The way we have designed our product is that, uh, or our loan management system is that we have to configure a new loan, right? So we don't have to actually do development with a new loan. So a partner comes to us. We sit and understand the product with them. And then it takes us one day to configure that. And that allows us to go and integrate technologically with a new partner in one to two weeks, right? Which is a big differentiator for us, right? Now, coming to the risk side, right? How do we do risk management, especially uh, when we are looking at loan applications? Of course, we have traditional risk scorecards, which are, you know, uh, data backed or analytics backed, right. which many banks and uh, nowadays already have functioning, yeah. right? So these are based on, you know, traditional data such as, you know, credit history from credit bureau, uh, from financial statements uh, or bank statements, which are submitted by the customers or the details which are submitted by the customers. 
but a lot of our customers come from the new to credit segment right they are taking loans for the first time or they have taken very small ticket loans before right so from their past credit behavior you cannot judge what their future credit behavior is going to be and such customers typically tend to get rejected by banks and nbfcs right whereas what we are doing is you know we have realized that most of our lending is digital in nature which means that a customer has some sort of an app on their phone and they are traversing the lending journey through that right so what we do is we also ask them for certain information uh, you know such as the sms data geolocation data so on and so forth right and using these sources of information because today a lot of financial transaction information is available in sms right we have built our proprietary uh, algorithms in order to also evaluate this sort of customers right that is our usp because uh, 20 to 30% of our customers are new to credit and we are able to underwrite them in a profitable way and we are able to show good gnpa figures right or or uh, you know low credit losses with this customer segment as well good so that gives me cue to you know next two questions that i would want to ask so you hinted on that gnpa term right so for yeah. benefit of our viewers can you explain what is an npa and i know there is something called gnp and called net np right if you can define those and how have you performed on, on these parameters sure yeah so uh, you know any loan for an nbfc or a bank is an asset right because you get interest income out of that asset right now if a customer doesn't repay right the emi or the you know daily payment whatever be the case for the loan right then that customer is defaulting on the loan right and if a customer defaults for more than 90 days right mm -hmm. so it's been 3 months and they have not paid back their dues then they are categorized categorized as npa or non performing assets because you know they have not paid for 3 months so there's a low probability that you know you are going to recover your money from this customer right. of course some recovery still happens from this base but it is much lower than what you get from customers who have been paying right. back on a regular basis right and this is rbi norm itself right not paid absolutely beyond 90 days means default you mark it as a default absolutely it's a it's marketed as npa right and as it's a it's a it's a rbi regulation so any bank any nbfc has to market as npa and it is a measure of you know how good are the risk capabilities of that financial organization right typically right. right so in our case right in our uh, msme and retail loan both the portfolios we have been able to maintain a gross npa of around 0.25% both in March and also in our uh, last results in September. December results are awaited, but they are expected to be in the same ballpark, right? Our long-term expectation is to always keep this below 1%. And in the last two years of our existence, in every quarter, we've been successful in keeping it uh, below 1%. All right. So, like, uh, so for our viewers, uh, what um, Earthmate has the stats as is as I understand from what Swami just mentioned is that if they have lent hundred rupees, twenty five pesa probably has not got paid back to the borrowers. The rest has been paid back, has been serviced by the borrowers to whom it has been lent. Right, Swami? That is the simplest way of putting it. Yes. All right. Now, because we are discussing on this, uh, you know, on a ratio, a very important ratio, uh, this GNP and net NP that we discussed, right? Next question uh, would be to Mohit. Uh, Mohit, if you can share with us as an NBFC or for your NBFC arm, right? Mamta Projects, what are the top three key financial <coughs> metrics that you are measuring? Please define them, right? For our viewers, for our audience. And then, you know, I'd request you to share your numbers also. How are you doing over there? Good, bad, ugly? Yeah, over to you. Sure. <clears throat> so I think, uh, Abhijit, this, there was a question related to this in the in the chat also, right? So I think this is the right time to answer that. So I think, see, uh, a lot of time in case of banks and NBFCs, uh, a metric which is being looked at is uh, what is your uh, AUM growth, right? But uh, the ethos, what we follow as a company right that's not the most important the right metric to look at right because as somebody also mentioned in the chat uh, distributing uh, money is not uh, difficult right collecting money is the most important part in that's case true. of a bank or an nbfc right so uh, uh, that's why uh, apart from uh, the aum growth right which uh, 
we have done phenomenally well, right? If you see uh, the last year, FY22, our uh, end AUM, uh, basically the total loan book was 272 crores, right? Which has grown to uh, approximately 400 crores, right? By the end of December. And we are expecting that this would be uh, anywhere in the range of uh, 700 to 800 crores by the end of uh, March, right? Now, the three key important metrics March, which we measure. This March, 2023. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So the three key important metric, which as an organization, we uh, very keenly focus on are uh, one is GNP, right? Which Swami just explained, right? Because that is the measure of how good you are uh, in terms of your credit underwriting. And secondly, how good are your collection capabilities, right? Because if you are, if you have distributed the loan and if you are not able to collect, then it's of no use, right? In so that cards, metric, sir. yeah, you're, you're out of cards, right? So that metric we have kept in check uh, uh, quarter on quarter right so uh, it's uh, uh, it's below 0.25% right uh, for the last almost now eight quarters right the second metric which we uh, which we measure is and which is a very important measurement is that uh, what is your profitability right what is your ppt margin after uh, the GNP numbers, right? So uh, last year, uh, the uh, in the audited financial, this number was five percent, the PVT margin, because that was our first year of operations. This year, till September, this number has go, uh, gone up to ten percent, right? And we, we expect is, this to be there is yeah. a two x jump in your yeah. PVT. Yeah, and this becomes very important, specifically given that we have a we have a we are a technology first company, right? Typically, you will see a lot of uh, fintechs or technology first companies being in losses due to uh, due to the investment in technology, right? But we have we have been very very uh, frugal uh, in our approach, uh, so as to say, right? That we we want to grow the business, but we want to, we only want to grow it profitably, right? So that's the imp uh, second important metric, and the third important metric which we look at and which is also a uh, RBI regulated metric, right? Uh, there's something called as a CRAR, right? Which is a capital adequacy. So for every 100 rupee of loan, uh, how much capital you have in your book? So in case if something goes bad, right? What is the cushion you have in terms of uh, the capital adequacy, right? So RBI prescribes for NBFC that number to be 15% uh, 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 minimum. Right. We have consistently maintained that over 20%. Right, so we are being very, very con uh, conservative in our approach, right? In in that terms, that we want to have a healthy capital adequacy ratio, so that uh, we provide enough and more cushion. Although our GNP numbers are uh, very low, but still we we measure that metric very, very closely. Got it. I, I think um, you know what I understand from this last metric, the capital adequacy ratio that you mentioned. Right? <clears throat> so, um, from a Lehman's perspective. If I am lending out 100, right, I should have 100 rupees. I should have 15 rupees with me in case there is a requirement to be paid back to the lenders of the money, right, uh, from whom yeah. I have raised capital. I am able to pay that. And RBI does its own statistical analysis and has come up with that figure. You are yeah. keeping it at 20% means you are keeping 5 rupee extra on top of that as a cushion. Uh, actually, if you would have lent, you would have made more money. But still... Yeah. To maintain a fiscal prudence, uh, you are actually keeping that cushion for you know for your investors, for the lenders, exactly to your NBFC RBI. Okay, okay. Exactly. And the logic behind this metric from RBI side is also that RBI uh, RBI uh, accepts uh, that uh, typically your losses will not go above let's say uh, fifteen percent, right? Uh, in a case of NBFC, so in case of just to give you a correlation, right? In case of banks. Uh, this metric, uh, this number is around uh, eight nine percent. In case of NBFCs, it it is higher because NBFCs typically do a slightly uh, high risk business, right? So RBI ex accepts you to uh, maintain around fifteen percent, and they ex uh, they think that your losses will not go above this, right? And that's that you rightly mentioned that it's a statistical analysis which they have done and basis that they come out with the regulation. Right. So in queue uh, with that, right? My next question would be to you, Madhusudan. You know, it's going to be a, a difficult question, and um, but I want to ask, right, for the benefit of our viewers. So, first question: What's been your revenue in the past year? What is the revenue that you know Artmate is making this year? What's a profit after tax that you have made in the past year? 
what is the profit after tax you are going to make this year mohit mentioned profit before tax i want to know what is the profit after tax you have paid off everything all the expenses taxes do you keep any money or you are in the red please yeah yeah so so i'll i'll give a, a matrix on three critical numbers one is the total disbursements that we did last year was about 1062 crores Sure. And this half year, uh, half of this year, as of September, we did another seven hundred crores of disbursements. And both the years we have made profits. And uh, previous year the revenue was ninety seven crores. H one of this year is ninety one crores. And PBT last year was about three point eight crores. And almost a similar number for H one of this year. So you are right. poised to make. More profits this year than what you made. I now. think yes, we the PBT would be around fifteen to eighteen this year, and I think after tax and all other deductions should be in the range of ten plus crores, ten to twelve crores of PBT this year. You know that's, right. that's and, that's, and, and sorry, one one, one yeah, extremely important number I think the viewers should know is also it is not a concentrated portfolio or a concentrated set of borrowers who we lend the money to, right? In the last eighteen months uh, to twenty months, we have lent to about seventeen lakh borrowers across the country. So, and the average ticket sizes are around sixty thousand rupees. The average tenure is about six months, right? Which means the one of the key important the key metric that both Samit and Mohit mentioned in terms of NPA, it is not that I have experience in one cycle and I am giving this number. I have already gone through five six sorry I don't know four. five cycles of lending that we did over a period of time where the money was given and recovered and then the npa is about 0.25% so that shows the uh, broad based lending that we do across the categories across the borrower profiles across the merchant profiles and across the geography of the country i think that's 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 a very you know interesting and intriguing point right companies struggle hard in their initial years to even you know get in the black for benefit of our viewers being in the black means being being profitable right but early on in your early years itself you have become profitable right uh, so i think there's something tremendously you know powerful that you guys are doing and so you know for the benefit of entrepreneurs and business owners would be there at, uh, on this webinar right if you can share some key learnings over there you know the few key things that you have done right which has helped you become profitable so soon yeah i think i'll uh, give two points and probably mohit or samit can add subsequently i think one i think what is important is to realize what you are not at the beginning of the journey right so we are not a retail lending business which means i am not going to set up hundreds of branches in the country i am not going to spend money to acquire customers we are not that right when you have uh, this much capital you would as well want to lend and make more revenue out of that than actually uh, spend money on some of these fancy expenses what i would call and uh, to actually and there is one key term which i learned which is which i'll just use here so all all the startups uh, are fairly you know i think used to this kind of terminology there is a vanity metric right so we don't chase vanity metrics i don't care what is my logins i don't care how many ads i pump in the market I, it's not my core business and if you look at the payments business abhi i will draw a corollary look at bill desk and go to their website and you would see you would think for a minute that are they real in the business uh, right but they are the most profitable payments company in the country right and the ethos are similar for us we are a b2b first we are revenue focused Uh, sanity focus, sanity metrics focused, and hence the entire uh, uh, focus is on how do I allocate capital to the revenue generating activity activities first, than anything else at this point of time. I think that that thought process has really helped, and second, uh, which has really helped us is also to build parallel revenue streams beyond just lending as a business. Right? I think one of the questions I just saw in the chat box. so uh, last year we had 92% of the revenue coming from lending and 8% from other services so i think this year uh, if i'm not wrong it would be around uh, 15% from others and 85% from lending and our endeavor in uh, i think by f25 is to have this as a 30 to 40% of the revenue coming from non lending business 
and that's where uh, the focus is and this has uh, again helped us uh, to boost our revenues profitably got it so me to mohit anything if you want to add no madhu i think you covered the points so just to summarize um, you know my key takeaways over here would be laser sharp focus on revenue spend whatever seems to be legitimate if possible don't spend on marketing if you have to do it in you know in a way so that it turns profitable keep key uh, eye over there not on vanity metrics but on metrics which target towards your revenue for your business growth and number 3 if you have multiple streams of revenue which are adjacent to each other within your business space that's like the killer combination yeah absolutely cool so uh, next question to somit um, you know given that you are, are, are an rbi regulated entity right rbi has got a lot of regulations for nbfcs and i'm sure you guys have to continuously comply with them so recently there was this bnpl uh, related regulation regulatory norm which came in from the rbi also right did it impact you guys in any way yeah so i think one of the major regulations that uh, that is now very important with our style of business are the digital lending guidelines that came from rbi uh, towards the middle of august and then also you know some modifications were made that and uh, made in that in beginning of september right so I mean, so I, i'll just pause you for a minute if you could explain the bnpl you know regulation that came in uh, and, yes. and then elaborate further yeah so if you look at you know if, even though it's a long list of regulations but if you categorize the things that rbi now requires nbfc to do when it comes to digital lending they would come under three broad categories right firstly what they want is so usually there is an nbfc right and there's also a fintech arm who is actually acquiring the customers right so rbi considers these arms as agents for the nbfc right so they are in a way loan sourcing agents or some sort of a service provider to an nbfc which is lending the money right so two key things right that rbi is very very particular about now is that the money has to go directly from the bank or the nbfc which is the regulated entity to the customer or the end borrower right the money should not go to an account in the middle and the fintech should not have any control over this money and the way it is disbursed and to whom it is disbursed right. similarly when the customer is making the repayment the money has to go directly from the customer's bank account to the bank account of the uh, lender right which is us in this situation right or it could be any other bank or nbfc so which is third lending. party in between basically that's a main regulation absolutely no third party in between you can use a third party in order to acquire customers digitally Understood. but the money transaction should not have any involvement of Understood. the third party right the, those are the first two key things right apart from that right the next set of regulations that rbi has put in is more around you know being fair to the customer and disclosing right disclosing and being transparent to the customer so you know there were a lot of practices where you guys would have also heard about a number of chinese apps which came under rbi scanner yes. you know a year or so ago where there were a lot of hidden charges right or very very you serious uh, interest rates which were hidden right so the contract was made in such a way that the customer probably did not understand how high the interest rate was right uh similarly you know there were certain data items which were being taken from customers phones but without uh you know without the customer really understanding why they are being taken or without the customer even knowing that they are being taken right so what rbi has done is really strengthen these disclosure norms right so they have given you know specific formats in which you will have to explain the interest rate right the sanction letter that you have to give now there's a specific format to it right so you cannot we were from that format right regardless of what you were doing before so on the disclosure side right and on the permission on taking data side you know again they have put in a number of uh, strict norms right so we have 40 plus sourcing partners right so what we did when this came out is you know we uh, so uh, i mean we are lucky in a way because one of our board members is an rbi veteran uh, right uh, Mr Rajiv Obra he was also a general counsel in a number of major banks such as IDFC First Bank etc so we took his guidance right 
uh, we created you know some sort of a, a SWOT team so as to say within the company and work with each of our partners to go point by point and see if we are adhering exactly to the RBI guidelines. And whenever we were not adhering, we went about making those changes, right? And in the first week itself, we figured out, you know, which are the areas where we need to make the modifications. And till the modifications were made, we actually stopped dispersal. So if somebody looks at our financials, what you would find is that the month of August and September, our dispersals were much lower than what they were before. And that's because with the number of partners, we had stopped dispersals till, you know, these guidelines were uh, 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 fully complied to. But now, you know, I can happily say that all our 43 sourcing partners who are live today, uh, right? We comply 100% to all the RBI guidelines, right? And we also have put in an internal audit uh, mechanism to, on a quarterly basis, see that, you know, the partners are also meeting their end of the bargain, right? So the kind of data that they take, the kind of disclosures that they make is in line with what is uh, aligned with us. Understood, understood. So question to you, Madhusudan. Now, you know, moving ahead, What's the future plan of expansion for the business? How are you looking at it five years down the line? You want to become a profitable, you're already profitable, yeah, yeah. A profitable unicorn sometime soon. Yeah, I, I think the few couple of metrics that we have set ourselves for FI25 as the benchmark, Kabijit. One, I think this year we are going to end at around 1500 uh, to 1600, 1700 crores of dispersal target. And from here on, what we are looking, and this is without any co-lending uh, as the proposition, right? So far, this entire lending has happened from Mamta Project's own balance sheet, right? Now, uh, what I would like to share with the uh, audience is that we have now onboarded four co-lending partners. Uh, I'll just take a couple of names for reference. One of them is Central Bank of India, and the second one is Aritya Finance. And both of them are coming on board with almost 500 to 1,000 crores of annual lending from their own side, where we are expected to put 20% and they would put 80% of the money. So the moment we add co-lending partners where I need to only put 20% of my money, suddenly my ability to pump in 1,500 crores will, will result in almost seven to 10,000 crores of annual disbursement, right? So that's the way we are going to progress as we go ahead. And by FI25, our target is to get to annual disbursement of around 20,000 crores. Uh, and I think we will cross magical uh, 10,000 crores of AEM by that time uh, with almost, I think, the profitability in the range of 1,500 to 1,700 crores. I think at that scale, uh, we would definitely be in top 10 NBFCs in the country, if not uh, better. And like what you said, yes, we are, we, are, we are already profitable and none of this growth would come at the cost of uh, declining profit margins for us. Well said. So it's it's uh, what I understand is, you know, your business is growing pretty fast and uh, you're on the right track and definitely you will become a unicorn profitable already now. Yeah. Unicorn, as they say, right? Sometimes Absolutely. I think... Then the next question would be to Mohit, you know, regarding this, that, you know, very pertinent numbers, Madhusudan, that you shared, right, that you are co-lending, wherein you are also lending from your books, around 10,000 crores of disbursal you're looking forward to make eventually a couple of years down the line from your own books. So have you raised money, you know, via bonds and debentures, you know, uh, from your uh, from your suppliers or, you know, from, from investors before and like, what kind of uh, structures have you given on that, if you can share? So <clears throat> I can I can take on the debt side, uh, right? What we and Somit, maybe you can elaborate on the equity side. So on the debt side, uh, we have uh, over last uh, two years of our existence, we have done multiple uh, rounds of uh, non-convertible debenture issuance, right? We have come out with that, uh, and we have raised close to thirty-seven crores through that, right? Uh, the typical uh, tenure of those uh, NCDs are around 18 months, 15 to 18 months. And the typical coupon size uh, on the NCDs is around 13 to 13 and a half percent. Got it, got it. Obviously, the starting series were slightly at a higher rate. Uh, it was, uh, if I'm not wrong, it was around at 14 and a half. Uh, but uh, the most recent series at, are 15 months tenor at 13 and a half. Yeah, they are 15 months. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so 15 months, uh, okay. 15 months tenor, Abhijit, 
13 and a half percent annualized rate uh, where the interest yeah. is paid out on a monthly basis monthly basis uh, and principal at the end of 15th month xirr works out to be around 14.37 percent that's Fair the enough. kind of uh, debt that we have reached okay. and apart from that we also have few uh, uh, icds uh, to the tune of about 250 to 60 crores as well when the cost is slightly lower but the total debt hence uh, looks around uh, 280 to 290 crores uh, direct Got it, got it. And are you looking to raise money through debentures anytime soon? Absolutely. I think, you know, that's part of our, uh, that's a part as of NBFC, the you know, the more the appetite uh, on the borrowing side, uh, I need to be able to continuously raise money uh, strategically to be able to meet the demand. And like I just told you, Central Bank of India coming with almost 1,000 crores of uh, lending from their side. So I need to be ready with 200 crores from our side to be able to support this right. book, right? So we, we raise money through a combination of debt and equity to support this. Okay. Cool. I think, um, and I think we can expect similar kind of structure in the you know follow-on NCDs also. Probably. Absolutely right. Okay. That's, that is the plan yeah. as of now. Okay. Yes. Okay. Good to know that. Fair enough. So that's the Stellar management team from Earthmed for you, ladies and gentlemen. With this uh, we come to the conclusion of my discussion with the team. Now the floor is open for Q&A. We have got tons of questions over here, which has been posted by our viewers. I'm going to take them up uh, one by one. I'm sure we will not be able to cover all, but I'll try to take up the significant ones. And you know the others, probably we can, you know, we can reach back to you and share answers. We get some clarification on those from the team at EarthMate and we can share them with you. So let's get started. So the first question is, this is from Joel. And Joel asks the question, do you help funding SME in transportation and air freight business? Question to you, Samit. I think Mohit would be the right person to answer this question, given that he looks after supply chain financing as well. Yeah, so uh, we uh, we are not. So let me put it this way, right? So are we doing it actively, right? Uh, is there a is this a separate line of business for us? No, uh, but on a case to case basis, we do look at uh, SMEs in the uh, in the freight business and the transportation business. Okay. The next question is, this is from Mr. Karunakara, and he asks the risk assessment. Is it focused on P2P lending or to retail banks? Mm, not sure. Like, um, um, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure what, what exactly uh, the question is, but I, uh, you know, the risk assessment is at a borrower level, irrespective of the source or the partner through whom uh, we are getting. If, I don't know if that is probably what he's trying to ask. I think uh, every customer borrower, I mean, the borrower, every borrower who's, who comes into the system irrespective of whether he's coming through partner one, partner two, partner three, we have our business rule engine, we have our credit and risk assessment scores, we have a concept of ABC scores, which is through a combination of credit bureau, SMS scrubbing, geolocation tracking, and any other unstructured data. Uh, unless a customer passes through this profiling, uh, there is no loan that is ever disbursed. Right. We have the next question. Uh, this is from this is from uh, Bashir, and Bashir asks if you can summarize uh, what is the company's size, and if the team can highlight uh, the key revenue streams. What he essentially wants to understand is percentage revenue from lending versus percentage revenue from licensing software. Yeah. I believe as sure. is as of date. Yeah. yeah. So, which is what I, sure. I, I, I thought we touched that, uh, which is about 15% of our revenue is from non-lending sources as of now, which was about 8% in the previous year. And going forward, we look at this mix as about 30 to 40% of that through non-lending and about 60% through lending business. Got Samit, I, I hope that's right. That is right. And if you look at the size of the company, so from an NBFC perspective, right, uh, we have <clears throat> an AUM of close to 370 crores, right? So that is a measure of the size of the NBFC in particular. And in terms of revenue, like we said, last financial year, we had a revenue of 96 crores. This financial year in the first half, we've had a revenue of 91 crores. We are expected to uh, end this financial year anywhere between 180 to 200 crores in terms of uh, revenues. 
Next question is from is Georgie Joseph, and he asks the question. More questions coming in, so my screen is scrolling up. Um, why are we offering this high interest rate for NCDs that you have done in the past, like thirteen point five percent? And why is the maturity cap so short, like fifteen months, like you mentioned? And the reason why he asks this question is. is it because you see borrowing rates coming down and rate cuts happening after 15 months in the economy that's it's got an economic angle what rbi is is going to do speculation around that so maybe we can address accordingly so there's so two aspects on this uh, abhijit one on first i'll talk about the tenure first uh, so i see like i told you our average lending uh, the tenure itself is around 6 months right which means i really don't need extremely long term capital locked in at high rates of interest right. right right so that is the reason why we kept it 15 months because anything anything extremely short there is unnecessary operational headache for us anything extremely long i'll have to lock myself into a slightly higher interest rate that is where i think 15 months perfectly fits in second when it comes to the cost i think when we started our business like again mohit said we, obviously when you start as a uh, lender you don't get your rating in the first few months of your operations right so that is where we had to start at a certain cost of uh, borrowing the money through right. cds and the benchmark somewhere as of now as we speak is around 12 to 13 and a half percent is the benchmark for peers like us so probably within a couple of months we'll uh, we would love to uh, relocate it and uh, uh, revise the rates of interest that we are offering right we have a question next question is from um, an anonymous attendee so <laughs> name not available so so the question that has been put up is when you say disbursed do you refer to your share of the co-lent assets or the gross value of assets placed with your lending partners and with whom you are sharing the risk so i think it was made very clear like i mean that that 10000 crores right which is projected in a couple of years is purely from their books for from the nbfc arm of earthmate so overall i think you mentioned 25000 right 25000 20000 crore yeah. yeah so as right. of so now abhijit uh, i'm sorry i'll just uh, leave one point somit so as of now there is no coal lending aum out of the 370 crores that somit mentioned as of now the com complete uh, disbursement come am is all on our books right yeah, so much yeah that is absolutely right only from this quarter onwards would we uh, start seeing a significant portion of co lending right but when we talked about the 20000 crore future projection yes that took into account what is going to be disbursed by our co lending partners as well not just us and we make a certain amount of fee on that as well right so there's a co lending margin or fee that we make on that 80% that is disbursed by the partner in order to facilitate this transaction understood understood we have a next question from ritesh singh and ritesh's question is what are the yields you charge from customers i believe by customers he means the the borrowers that's number one um next question is who are your equity investors what is your credit rating and who are the partners on lending side like maybe names of he has asked the names of banks whom you would have partnered that was partially answered um, uh, like aditya birla was mentioned muthut was mentioned and i think um, central bank central bank yeah yeah so that answers the last question but maybe on the first three questions of yield you charge to your customers investors maybe on the cap table any significant investor that you would have you know that lends a lot of you know credibility and your credit ratings yeah. right so i'll i'll start with the first question right so the yields that we charge to the end borrowers are anywhere from 16% to 30% depending on the type of product and the credit profile of the customer right, right. uh are equity investors so the original equity investors when this company started of course the two founders uh, vihan kumar and nanjan kan uh, you know they own 60% of the close to 60% 58% of the equity in the company one of our major investors was resilient innovations technology right which is the parent company of bharat pay so when we started this company they were the first fintech that got onboarded with us it was a strategic partnership with them and they made an investment right and the other investors are family and friends of uh, the founders right so that was the original investment round 
right now we are actually in the middle of uh, you know raising an investment uh, of close to 250 to 300 crores of which 170 crores are already raised and if we talk about the major investors in the 170 crore which is uh, you know already committed or raised uh, the major investors would be uh, you know the lucky family office dilip lucky family office uh, mr dilip lucky was an ex promoter of indusind bank uh, and is a diamond merchant and a big public market investor there is also Mr. Alok Agarwal uh, and family. Uh, Mr. Alok Agarwal is the uh, CFO of RIL Reliance, right? So he has uh, invested. Uh, I'm just talking about the marquee investors. This is there's of course a large uh, list of investors as well. There's a Singapore-based, uh, you know, family office, uh, family office money VC called NAV Capital, which has uh, also invested in us. And uh, there are a few investors from the technology domain. Mr. Selesh Rao, ex TPG, ex Google, uh, you know, he's started a VC called uh, Escape Velocity, right? Uh, there's a VC, uh, there's a founder of a VC called Astract Venture who has also invested. These are some of the key names in here, but the major investors would be uh, uh, Lucky Family Office, uh, Mr. Alok Agarwal. Right. Next question is from uh, Suman. Um, Suman Mazumdar and what he asks is what is uh, I think this has already been answered what is the net interest margin for previous financial year and this year yeah so if we talk about our margins right or say the unit economics right uh, like we said we have been lending anywhere from 16 to 30 uh, percent the average lending rate would probably be close to around 25 percent right our cost of funds, uh, you know, all in all, taking into account the blended cost of debt and equity is around 12 and half percent, right? So, so the margin there is between, you know, 25 and 12 and half, which is, uh, you know, around 12 to 13 percent, right, would be our margins. But within that, you know, because we are not directly sourcing these loans, we are sourcing through uh, our sourcing partners and we also take help from collections, right, uh, from these partners, right? We give away, you know, anywhere from 6 to 7% as sourcing and collection fees, right, based on the efficiency of collections as well. So we are left uh, with out of, you know, 13% of net interest margin, we are left with around 6% uh, to cover, uh, you know, the credit losses as well as our operations cost. Right. So around 6% is what we can assume. Yes. Okay. All right. I think we are at the you know fag end of the this of our time. We are going to just overshoot. So I'll take last two questions. Very interesting questions. First one is: Do you have any plans for launching IPO? Because you're already profitable, scaling up. You know, scaling up pretty well. I can see a lot of questions, repeat questions. I, I mean, I'll club them together. Sure, yeah, yeah, There's yeah. a question around when are you launching your IPO? It, it's not obviously before 2025, uh, Abhijit. So I think we have a, a long way to demonstrate some of the capabilities that we have started to build. We would rather, uh, rather spend our energy on building uh, and scaling up at this point of time. And I think subsequently, obviously, uh, that the goal is to be eventually uh, make it public. All right. So, so that makes it clear to our viewers. You know, Artmain definitely uh, profitable, scaling up fast, um, and some years down the line, definitely the. I mean, I, I think uh, an IPO is on the cards, so we can look out for that. Last question. That's that's pretty interesting. Once again, because you're not doing an IPO right now, right? So the question is how to invest in your company, a fintech company as a small investor? <laughs> Is there any such avenue available? Yes, there are, of, of course. I'm like what Samit just mentioned earlier, as of now, we are in the midst of uh, raising uh, equity and debt as well uh, through multiple channels. I think the best way is to reach uh, uh, our friends at Golden Pie. <laughs> And they'll be able to suggest uh, probably ideal way uh, to figure out how do we make it happen for any of the investors. Sure, sure. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that's it. We had an extremely energized, extremely informative uh, discussion. Learned a lot about Earthmate and the NBFC world in general. I hope each of you have got some valuable information which will help you in taking your steps towards fixed income investments. Until next time, see you. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Abhijit. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, Abhijit, for inviting us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Bye bye.